Hola, this is Enrique of Gente Unida with Sarah Bella. And once again, we have another episode of Buen Hombre, Magnificent Mujer. And we're delighted that you're all joining us. And once again, we have an incredible, magnificent mujer that we're going to be speaking with today. She is no stranger to San Diego. She is no stranger to a lot of people that are involved with media, uh, with activism. She's been in San Diego quite a while. We're going to find out a little bit more about her history. And I'm speaking about Laura Castaneda. Laura, welcome to Buen Hombre, Magnificent Mujer. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you. Good to see you again. And at the very beginning of our podcast, Laura, I always like the person to uh, introduce themselves. I know that you've been in front of the camera, behind the camera. You've been a teacher. You've been an activist. You've been involved with the Latino Film Festival. You're a big advocate about uh, women's rights and diversity in the media. But if I, if somebody asks you, like I'm asking you now, who is Laura Castaneda? What would you say? So tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, a little bit about your background. I'm just a kid from the barrio. That's who I am, and I'm proud right. of it. I was born and raised in Chicago, inner city, which I'm very, very proud of. And, uh, you know, I, I tell people, my family, you know, it, I've always had this diverse everything, my diverse life. We were one of the first uh, Latino families, Mexican-American families, to move into the neighborhood that I grew up in Chicago, uh, Logan Square, which is on the northwest side about... 20 minutes from Wrigley Field. And, you know, yeah, absolutely. And as the years, you know, rolled on, uh, the neighborhood started to change and it became uh, predominantly Puerto Rican. So now I was another minority because I was in a, a Mexican American growing up with a lot of Puerto Ricans. Um, and it was beautiful. It was wonderful. I knew how to salsa dance before I could dance rancheras. <laughs> and um, me encanta la comida y todo. So I had that great upbringing. Um, my dad worked for Greyhound bus lines. He was a ticket agent and my mom was like mostly a stay at home mom, but she worked part time. So, you know, having that background and uh, then I went to a high school that was about 75% Latino. And from there I ended up going downstate to uh, the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, which was 1% Latino, including graduate students. Wow. So to have that dynamic, it really opened my eyes culturally, um, took me out of my comfort zone and, and kind of gave me a taste of what the real world was like. And so that was a, you know, an interesting situation there. And I think I learned a lot of my activism there uh, at Illinois and left there and I got very, very lucky. I got my first job right outside of school at the ABC station in Chicago in my hometown um, as a production assistant, making zero money, but that's okay because it was like graduate school. It was, you know, learning, learning the ropes with the, with the big leagues, with the people that were really, um, that I admired growing up. Um, but I will also add that very few of them looked like me in that newsroom. And after a couple of years, I decided I wanted to be a reporter and I moved on to Tucson, Arizona. I had never really, I'd been out West to visit, but I'd never, you know, been out West long enough to know what living in the Southwest was like. So that was an incredible experience. It was my exposure to the border. It was my exposure to cop culture because I was a, uh, mostly covering um, the border and crime. So I was around a lot of law enforcement and uh, Native Americans. I learned a lot about the Native American communities working in Tucson. And then, you know, it was just the natural thing to do when you're moving up in media, you end up going to a bigger city, most people. So um, I had the opportunity to apply for a couple jobs all within the same week. I had an interview in Milwaukee. I had an interview in San Diego and I had an interview in Las Vegas all within like a month. And um, the one in Milwaukee and San Diego was within three days of each other. And I had to make a decision and I wanted to go back home to Chicago. So Milwaukee would have really been the obvious choice. I could have been working in Chicago right now, I'm sure if I had done that, but I, I went to Milwaukee and I, it was in February and I, they flew me out here to San Diego to interview with KGTV. 
uh, Channel 10 in February, and then it was a no-brainer <laughs> in February. No coat, you know. Um, but really, I, I think mostly it was because when I walked into those two newsrooms, I felt the difference in the culture. And here in, in San Diego, everybody was really friendly. Everybody was happy. I saw people with smiles on their faces. And I didn't see that in Milwaukee. And, I, and that's really what convinced me to come out here and try my hand. I thought I'd stay for two, you know, three years, which is a usual TV contract. And then I was headed back home. That was my plan. But here I am all these years later. I'm still here. Well, that's quite a, a, a background. When you came to San Diego, was that the first time you ever came to San Diego? No, I had come on a, on a trip earlier, but just as a tourist, you know, I had come once before and um, obviously loved it, but I only saw the touristy part of it. I didn't, the time that I came, I, don't, I didn't even cross the border. So I just kind of saw, you know, what was uh, north of Interstate 8 and Balboa Park and, you know, just all the things that people who are not from here without knowing what to see, you know, see. What year was that, more when you came to San Diego to work for Channel 10? Um, it was 95. It was okay. 1995. I, and I got here, and um, I remember that was the year that it just rained and rained and rained and rained, and they, I kept, they kept sending me out to cover the rain, and I said to myself, man, what did I do, you know? Yeah. Uh, it was just rained, you know? It was, uh, it was quite an event, but... Um, News here was really different for me. News, you know, what was covered here was really interesting. And, and um, you know, managers come and go. I've had my good share and my bad share. But I, at the time, I had a news director that um, he was from Texas. He did not know a lot about San Diego, but he had an open mind. He called me into his office multiple times to ask me, you know, should we be doing this and what should we be doing? And um, I was learning my way around. I didn't know Tijuana very well. I didn't know the border very well. So um, I remember we had the opportunity, I had an opportunity to do a, an interchange uh, exchange program with a reporter from Canal 12 at Televisa across the border. So a photographer and myself went over there for a week and they sent a crew to KGTV for a week. And really it was more, it wasn't about, oh, you're gonna go cover this and you're gonna do that. It was more about going to meet all of them, observe how they do news, make inroads, you know, um, and the same for their reporter. Their reporter, it turns out, is Lourdes Sandoval, who oh, okay. a good friend and colleague, of mine, the news director of Univision right now. She's had a wonderful career. And we joke when we see each other, uh, once in a while we'll get together, or we used to anyway, have lunch, um, and laugh about that exchange that we did because you know the way Mexican news covers news is very different from the way American news is covered, you know, in many aspects. Yeah. And after that week passed, we were kind of comparing notes about what, you know, and I wasn't supposed to be sent out to cover news that week, but I was. And in fact, the general manager, um, Mr. Walsh at the time, I remember, you know, I was, tenía mucho miedo porque mi español es, you know, más o menos, my, my grammar's not perfect. English uh -huh. is my favorite language. But um, he's, at the beginning, they said, don't worry about it. You're not going to go in the air. You know, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Okay. Well, by the third day, he came up to me. He was like, no, 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 no. Tienes que hacer unas notas aquí. And then they put me on the set live with the anchor <laughs> to talk about my experience. And I was like, ah. But Lourdes and I always laugh about, you know, she came here and they had her cover something. It was like a, a you know, she, she called it like a cat in the tree story. You know, so just the philosophy about the way news is covered in both countries. And, you know, we kind of laugh about those philosophical differences sometimes. Lourdes is a, is a dear friend. As you know, she was also with the uh, Mexican consulate. And I've known yes. Lourdes for a, for a long time and we're, we're friends. And uh, yes, yeah, so we have a very interesting background. So when you grew up in Chicago, uh, did you speak Spanish at home? Because you said your, your um, English is uh, well, your main language. My parents, my parents spoke Spanish to each other. Um, but mostly it was English. Mostly it was English. My dad was born in El Paso and left when he was about 13 years old, got shipped out by my grandma to go to Illinois for many, many reasons that I won't go into. But um, 
you know, he was primarily dominantly Spanish speaker as well as my grandma, my great grandma, and they and they all ended up in Illinois. My entire family ended up on both sides of my family. Everyone's in Illinois. So with my grandma, my great grandmother, you know, familia, you know, when there was gatherings, puro español, mixed, you know, a lot of Spanglish. But in my household, it was it was it was definitely English. I uh, I spent a lot of time in Chicago through my years. And, and my work, I go and lecture all over the uh, the world, but especially the country. I've been in all 50 states. And in Illinois, uh, I've lectured at the University of Illinois, but I spend a lot of time at, at Pilsen, which as you know, is a very Latino community. Right. And I've done a lot of work there. And I've been uh, debating these last few weeks with a dear friend of mine, Elvira Arellano, whom you may not recognize the name, but she's the woman that holds up in a church and they yes. were deporting people. That was yes. it. Yes. Yes. Anyway, so we've been debating about uh, the recent visit by uh, AMLO to uh, Washington, D.C., which I was totally against. But anyways, that's, that's another issue. But yes, yeah, so I spent a lot of time in Chicago and as well as Wisconsin. Just, this, just recently I was speaking at, uh, I think it's called Riboli College. I've spoken a lot at the University of Wisconsin, but this is a small school. I think it's called Riboli. And now it's all through Zoom, because usually, you know, you go there and you lecture and so on and so forth. Now I'm doing everything through Zoom, as I have been of late in the last few lectures that I've done at schools. You know, we're living in a whole new world, a whole different situation. And it must have been quite um, kind of surprising to you when you came out here and you're talking about how the news is different. I thought you were going to say something. Really? You want me to talk about the rain? That's like a news story in San Diego? <laughs> Well, you know what? Well, no weather is big in in Illinois because of the seasons. I mean, we've had so many storms, and you know, there's a power outage in the summertime, and then all of a sudden, you have a lot of dangerous situation. We don't have wildfires like you know, like there are here, but weather weather can be huge there too. You know, just depending, but majority of the news is not good, and majority of the news is um, you know, there's a lot of lot more crime. And the other thing is um, politics. Boy, Chicago politics. There is, you know, no other city that has the politics like Chicago. So I grew up with that. And my dad um, may not have been formally educated, but he is extremely well read. I mean, my dad can have a conversation with a lot of people. And he, for coming from the barrio where that man came from, um, he spent a, a time working at the DNC. He's a, he's been a union organizer his entire life. So, you know, very well educated, uh, very well read, and I learned a lot from him watching and listening. You know, he was a good teacher. And speaking about being a good teacher, apparently you taught one of your pupils, one of your star pupils, is Sarah Bella. <laughs> yes, Please, I was some, so secrets, some secrets about her, but the, the world will <laughs> know some of the secrets. She was driven. But I remember, it's funny, you know, you have all these students for so many years, but you remember certain things about them. And what I remember about Sarah, she was driven. I believe she had a child, a daughter, if I'm not mistaken, who must be very big now. Um, but she didn't never use that as an excuse, boy. She she was driven. She she was wanted to be a storyteller. And I remember, I don't remember exactly the stories that she put together, but I know that I just remember her being so driven. Wow. Yeah. She, she is, she's very driven. and. She has a lovely daughter named Lily, uh, who's a teenager. And uh, so, yeah, so it's great. It's great how it's a small world. And maybe there's somebody else, you know, because you said you went from Chicago and then you were in Tucson. One of my dearest friends is in Tucson and covering the border, you might, I'm sure you met her, Isabel Garcia. Of course, she's a yeah. legend. She's an icon. She's I say that the two strongest advocates for the border anywhere in the United States were Roberto Martinez here in San Diego, rest in peace, and yes. Isabel Garcia in, in yes. Tucson. What, what do you remember about Isabel? That she was very outspoken, that she, you know, anything that happened, you didn't have to go looking for the other side of the story or the soundbite. She was out there, they were having press conferences, they did not stay silent. You know, that's how you know the true barrio warriors, you know, the people that look out for the voiceless is that they don't hesitate to speak out. They are marching, they are speaking. You did the same thing here for many, many years with the, you know, all of the, and you still do, for all the advocacy and 
you know, issues that go on. And, and uh, you know, back in those days, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't right. have video cameras. So, you know, when you're a reporter in a small newsroom like Tucson, you know, it's a smaller market, you're going based on phone calls and tips and, you know, information that people give you, and then you got to dig for it. It's not like now, you know, re, uh, reporters have a lot more resources in their hands to, to dig up information when they get, when they hear information like that. And sadly, and, and, and it's great that there's all these tools nowadays, but sadly, I think we, we as a society have lost a lot of ethics in journalism because before, like when you started, and when I was younger, uh, there was only eight, like three main stations and the reporters were really reporters and they were talking about the news. They weren't giving opinions as, uh, as you know, uh, some networks do today, which aren't really news stations, but they present information as news. And that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous because when you do that, there's people out there that believe it as being news and they act on it. And I don't think that's been healthy. Uh, I think it's very dangerous. And I think it's very important to be like your dad, where he's well learned, and he, you know, he he wants to find out what really is going on. He's not going to just have one network on, whether it's on the left or the right, and just believe that. You know, it's important that we know the truth, that we know what's really going on, and we make up our mind. And one of the things that I'm very passionate about, as you are, and I saw your recent article in the San Diego Union Tribune, and uh, we want to learn more about what you're doing there, is about diversity in the newsroom. Right around 1995. Um, I went to the San Diego Union Tribune, and I was very upset about their extremely right-wing leaning politics in those days. And I, I kind of called a meeting together with some of the leading activists of that time, around 1995. And an icon from that used to be at the Union Tribune, that was a consultant, was like the head guy there, Herb Klein. So Mr. Klein and and and. Uh, Mrs. Copley, I mean, we had the heavy hitters there at that table. Mm -hmm. We talked about the need for like a Spanish language paper with the Union Tribune and Roberto Martinez was there, I was there and so forth. And we, st we started saying how important it was to make changes, how important it was to make changes. And some changes took place, some changes took place. And that applies across the board, not just with the, the San Diego Union Tribune, but of course that's the big dog. As far as print media, that's the big dog. Sure. And uh, so, so when so why don't you tell us a little bit about your before we get to the Union Tribune, your career being involved in the film festival, teaching and so forth. How did all that develop? Because first you came to Channel Ten and you yeah. had your job, but you started yeah. doing a lot of other things. Well, you know what? Um, contracts usually roll on a three year. There, most television contracts were for reporters back in that that era were three years, right? So, I had a good stint. At 10, I was happy, um, but I was also the president of the California Chicano News Media Association, which kind of ties into, you know, exactly what you're talking about, the advocacy. And, you know, when you're a journalist, you have to be careful um, to advocate for only certain things, because once you, you know, kind of start tipping the scale too much, then how, are, how can you not be biased when you're covering stories, right? So that was always, um, you know, a legitimate concern about not um, putting bumper stickers on your car, for instance, or things like that. So I, you know, I was an advocate for journalism. Of course, I was going to be an advocate for journalism for some of the same exact things you're talking about, diversity, retention, you know, making sure that the community is covered correctly, et cetera, et cetera. So at the time, I'll try to keep the story short because I don't want to, you know, dominate the time with it. But long story short, I remember there was a, uh, a radio guy by the name of Hank Bauer who was on KFMB radio. And he went on the airwaves and was slamming my colleague at Channel 10 at the time, Sal Rivera. Uh, Sal was a reporter, just like me. Um, great reporter, really nice guy, you know, did a great job. And I don't know where it came from. Like Hank just started spilling out, you know, really negative comments about Sal saying that he had an accent both so thick he couldn't understand what he was saying, that he only had his job because of affirmative action, you know, kind of things like that. So when that came to my attention as president of CCNMA, I wrote a letter to him um, and his bosses, but it wasn't on Channel 10 letterhead, it was on the California Chicano News Media Association letterhead as president of the San Diego chapter. 
And my, um, by this time I had a new boss at Channel 10, the management had flipped over and the news director that I had at the time was Don Wells. And he didn't like that. He didn't like that I had written the letter. He, you know, there was a big, big flap over it. And um, so when my contract was coming up for renewal and, you know, you can call it whatever you want to, but I see that those two situations were probably connected. So me being an advocate didn't sit so well with him. My contract wasn't renewed and they just told me, you know, you can, you can leave. So I did, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do yet. So I ended up sticking around San Diego and went over to work with a fabulous team at Channel 4. Um, Dennis Morgino had put together a group of reporters to put a show together called San Diego Insider. Yes. And I, I remember I, I did a story on uh, Border Angels and you. I had interviewed you when I was working on that show. It was a fabulous huh? show. did some amazing work there. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the social media presence going on. So a lot of people didn't watch the show. They didn't know about the show, you know, um, it was only on cable. So I spent about three years there and then, um, you know, things just happen. Life unrolls, life happens. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do next. And the opportunity came up to teach a class at City College, a news yeah. writing class. And so I thought it would be fun. I thought it'd be great. And um, I started teaching that one class and you know the the people that were there the staples the foundation the the department leaders that had been there for 25 or more years um there was an opening someone was going to retire and they kept encouraging me to apply for it did i did not see myself as a teacher that was not what i set out to do in life but things just happened i applied for the job i got it and I loved being a teacher. I loved mentoring. I loved nurturing. I loved watching people like Sarah, you know, who had that fire in her gut and wanted to learn how to be a storyteller or do certain things. And then you see them a couple semesters later and they're just knocking it out of the ballpark. I was able to kind of instill in them a lot of my principles and values about journalism and making sure that you seek those stories out, cover all communities, you know, a lot of things that I don't think they probably got from other professors in universities, really, honestly. And the program was great, loved it for many, many years. I taught for 15 years. And then I'm sorry to say, I just- 15 years at City College? 15, 15 years at wow, City College. Wow, it's unbelievable. The years just flew by. And yeah, then- I didn't know that was that long. And then I, I had, I got married and I had a family of my own. So teaching was great for that too, because when you're a journalist, like you go to work in the morning and you don't know when the day's gonna end, you know? So I was very blessed, very happy there for many, many years. And then, you know, honestly, management changed and we had a dean there that I, you know, the nicest thing I can say about the dean that we had was nothing. She did not support the students. She did not support our department. Uh, she ended up uh, leaving City College under very questionable terms, being walked off campus by the campus police and human resources. I'll just leave it at wow. that. Um, and there, there was a lot of corruption going on in the department and otherwise. Um, so I just felt it was time for me to move on. So I retired and I'd been yearning again to get back into the, you know, journalism full time. A little hesitant because of kids but they're older now and they don't want to hang out with me anymore so i decided um, when i saw this position open up as community opinion editor on the editorial board that i would apply for the position so that's how i ended up coming back to industry and boy are we glad that you're there uh, because Thank you have such a great uh, reputation you have such a diverse background in the things that you've done and i could definitely relate to having upper management uh, all of a sudden, not agree with some of the things that you're doing, and the next thing you know, you're no longer yeah. there. Uh, right. you know, I had a situation when I was the vice president of Latino and diversity marketing for the San Diego Padres. I had my guardian angel, who was my boss, Larry Lucchino. He was there fantastic. You remember what a great guy he, he, he is, because he's still with us. Um, well, as soon as he left in there 2001, um, the, next very, the next month, I was no longer there. Because right. I was given a choice, Border Angels or the Padres. And I said, what kind of a choice is that? Yeah, baseball is nice and everything, but it's just a game. Border Angels and doing the human rights work 
that's what it's all about. You're, you're literally saving lives. Mm -hmm. So I went from maybe one of the happiest times of my life. I was going to get married, Stephanie and I and all that, to um, all of a sudden I'm out in the street. But I'll never regret it. Like you, I stood up for my principles and landed on my feet. And that's when I started the radio show. Morones por la tarde. First, it was just one in Spanish. And then later, I told the owner of the radio station, who happened to be the governor of Baja California, now Jaime Bonilla, I said, you know, I'd like to have an English language show, too, because he owns several stations. So I also had an English language show, and I brought in a co-host, Ralph Inzunza, and the show was called On the Record with Enrique and Ralph. I remember that, and, yeah. Yeah, and it was great, because I was talking all the time. And, and, and you know how it is when you're a reporter. I wasn't really a reporter. I was the host of a show. But it's like you could just walk up to anybody and start asking them stuff. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, you know, I could just walk up to, like, I remember one time I was at an event, there was John McCain. So I walk up to him and I go, yeah, I'm with uh, On the Record with Enrique and Ralph, San Diego. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Well, if you don't have that position, you can still try to ask somebody like questions like that. But they'll be going, yeah, really? But now you have a microphone in their face. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. And I remember Jaime told me something when he offered me the position. He said, you're going to fall in love with radio. And I thought, oh, I don't think so. I go, I've, I've done every radio show in the world, but as a guest, as a host, is totally different. And I did. I did fall in love with radio, and that's why I've had these podcasts and so forth. So that's a fantastic career that you've had, and, and we're glad that you're back. And with the San Diego Union Tribune, one of the things that happened, and I shared this with you in a recent communication, when they were selling the newspaper, and Platinum Group was the group that was selling it. Uh, one of the first things that the guy in charge did, uh, Jeff Light, whom I didn't know, was he got rid of three of the more prominent Latino journalists there. Uh, Ruben Navarrete, you know, Mexican background, Leslie Berestein, Cuban, and Leonel Sanchez, a Peruvian. All three, uh, you know, very prominent journalists. That's the, the, about the first thing he did. So what I did was when I saw that, I go, what? There they go again. And I immediately I contacted them and I said, we need to have a meeting. So I called up our friend Alex Nogales and I go, why don't, you, why don't you join us? And I got a couple of community people like August Chavez that you know, uh, Ricardo Griswold that you know. Uh, I asked Lydia Martinez but because of her position. She says, well, I'd rather not go, but I can send somebody and so on and so forth. So we got a little group and we met with Jeff. And I'll never forget when we were in the meeting, I was thinking, uh, there was, there's a guy named Hugh. I don't know if Hugh's still over there at the, at the Union Tribune, but he kind of met us and stuff. And they were both pretty young, young to me. So I was waiting for Jeff Light to show up because I was expecting a Herb Klein kind of guy, like an, old, like an old eminence, right? And all of a sudden I'm thinking, why are they asking all these questions? And then I realized, oh, that is Jeff Light. Because you know, he was so young compared, compared to what I was expecting. And I liked him right away. Uh, but I said, hey, Jeff, how could you get rid of these three? You need diversity. You need diversity in the newsroom. And it's unbelievable that one of the first things you did after you came from Orange County, you probably know his dad's a newspaper guy from Buffalo, and he, you get rid of these guys. And I go, I, I can't believe it. So we, had, we started having meetings, regular meetings. And I said, we need to have a Latino advisory group, a community advisory group. And we formed it. We ended up forming it, and, and changes began to happen. One of the things that I asked them for was you need to have uh, – Latinas and Latinos and people of color in senior positions, because otherwise you're blind. You're blind about the decisions that take place. I'm preaching to the choir because I know that, that you believe the same thing. And he goes, oh, we have a lot of diversity. So he called in the HR person and they brought in uh, all these uh, facts and figures about their, their, the way they were made up. And he goes, yeah, see, look, we have all this diversity. And I go, Jeff, all those managers you have on that chart, I bet you they're managers in the warehouse, they're managers in distribution, they're the drivers. That's exactly what it was. I go, but the decision makers, there's no decision makers. So, so we started that movement and so forth. And I'm glad that you're there because uh, they're moving in that right direction. But that's universal, not just with media. That is universal with baseball. I used to always bring that up as well. How come mm -hmm. you don't have women in senior positions or, or people of color? Mm -hmm. And then one of the other things I asked Jeff was I said, there's something that you cannot continue to do. The union treatment cannot continue to say illegal immigrant or illegal alien. And he said, I don't have the power to change. He agreed with me. But as soon as Manchester bought it, 
the very day, the very day that Doug Manchester bought the paper, I happened to come out on the front cover of the paper because there was an article about uh, the work that we were doing out in the desert and my picture was there. So I had a meeting with John Lynch and John Lynch's ma office was right next to Doug Manchester's. And as we came out, it was, as, as I met with John Lynch, I go, you, got, you can't use that term. He wrote a memo that day to say, we'll no longer use the term illegal alien or illegal immigrant. And I, now it's unauthorized. And, he, and I have that document here in my place. Anyways, it's so important to be vigilant and to stay on top of it. Because after that, I went and met with KPBS and NBC and CBS. And whenever I see somebody say it, illegal immigrant, I contact the news director right away. And I'll say, hey, NBC, we have a deal. Okay, I'll mm -hmm. talk to them. But to have somebody in, in the inside like you is so important because you're there. You're there with the community voices and all of these people. So the, I know Jeff is a really good guy. And, and, and the people that I've seen that you brought in, you have a good array of people, a good array of people on, on these issues. So how's that going, the community voices? Because I love the uh, article that you wrote about diversity in the newsroom. How, how do you see that going? Well, you know what? I got to tell you, Enrique, I um, am somebody that has been outspoken about this issue, just as I said, for wow. many, many years. And I don't know a lot about the history of the UT as much as you do, because you've had meetings with a lot of the people that were there and prior owners. But I will tell you this, if I didn't believe in where they're going, I would have never applied for this position. Because, you know, when they were in Mission Valley and they were owned by, you know, two other owners, let's just back up two other owners, maybe. <laughs> I don't think I would have applied for this position because I don't think it would have been the right place for me. But um, I do see that they have this community advisory board and I'm glad to know that you're, you're the one that helped launch it. I think it's a wonderful idea for every media outlet to have a community advisory board. We've had issues come up that we will bring to their attention and just get some feedback, you know, mm -hmm. because I think that's part of the problem when you don't have enough diversity in your newsroom, not just the Latino community, but I'm talking the LGBT community, the black community, the Arab American community. Um, you could, the slightest little thing that someone who doesn't know better out of ignorance could just use a phrase or a word or an image and you could rock the whole boat with the whole community without even really knowing what you're doing, you know? So I just think, you know, I've preached to this to my students over and over again, the more diverse your newsroom is, the stronger your newsroom is. So with the community advisory board, um, and then the, the Voices Project, the Community Voices Project is something that they uh, were talking about before I came in. I walked in the door in March, if, if you can believe that, in March. Um, but this is a wonderful way to give a platform to people in the community to just write on topics that they see happening in the community. They don't have to pick up the phone and try to get a reporter to come out and cover the story or, you know, because that's hard sometimes too. If you don't know how to maneuver the media, you don't know how to you know, get attention for an issue that's going on. But here these folks are given a platform where they can just write on anything, any topic. I mean, there's some guidelines, you know, no hate speech, no certain things, which obviously we wouldn't want that. But you know, let's say there's an issue going on in your community with environmental racism and, and you can't seem to get anybody's attention or write about it. And now with social media, you blast that all over social media, you'll get, you'll get some attention on the matter, you know? So I think it's a wonderful way for the community to be way involved in the paper. And I keep hearing this repeated in a lot of staff meetings, you know, that I've been involved in so far. It's like, we are here to service the community. We are the biggest newspaper in this community. We are here to service the community. So we need to build better bridges. We need to know who are the readers. The readership changes over time. You know, they're doing podcasts at the Union Tribune. How many people know that? They're doing, they, you know, they did a documentary series. How many people know that? We need to let people know what we're doing and what, you know, what is there for them. If you don't service the community, the community has so many other choices where they can go for news and information. You know that. So you have, you, have to, you have to understand that you're there for the community. And, and Jeff uh, Light is a personal friend of mine. I, I know him and his wife, and I've gone to their house to have meals and so forth, and I think he does a great job. 
I think he does a great job. And it's funny because it's sort of like uh, we're talking about some of the people that were there that are no longer there, like Ruben Navarrete. <laughs> Ruben Navarrete and I are actually compadres, if you can believe that. Uh, I mean, he's a good guy. But I'll never forget, I was in Washington, D.C. one time at a meeting, and Ali Nodani, whom you might know, he was describing both of us. We were both on a panel, and he goes, Ruben Navarrete is a guy that half the time you agree with his columns, and the other half you're going, what's he writing about? That's kind of the way Ruben is, right? Well, Ruben and I have become very close friends and compadres. And uh, it's important that we, um, that we speak out about these issues and that you have these community voices and these people from the community. How does it work? Like I'm Maria Garcia, let's say, and let's suppose that I, I'm one of the people on the, you know, in, this, in this group. And, then, and I, Maria Garcia, write an article about this. Do then you see it and say, or, or do they go to you first and say, hey, I want to write about this? Or do they, or do they present the article? How does that work? You know, it's really interesting the way it works. We, um, we have a board of six people, right? We have Chris Reed, who's like the main editorial writer. We have meetings, we talk about issues, and then he's like the representative of all of us. He'll write an editorial. He does the actual writing. Great writer, brilliant guy does his research. I mean, he's a really good writer. So that's how that part works, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for the editorials. <clears throat> but for the op-eds, we meet, you know, we have a meeting every morning and we just, you know, it's really about talking about what's happening. What, what are we missing the boat on? Um, and, you know, here are the two, you know, really, really big stories unfolding since I've been there in three and a half months, right? First we have the pandemic, which is the story of the century, and then we have the Black Lives Matter movement. So much of what we're doing is like peeling away the onion and saying, what are we missing here? Who, you know, what other, what, what are we missing? And then we've been put, they went from running like three op-eds a week or four or five op-eds a week to doing 15 or 16, 17, 18 op-eds a week. So we invite the community, if there's a topic that you wanna write about, we try to put them together in threes, like a package and run it on one page in one day if it's a bigger issue. Um, for example, we are doing next week, we're gonna be working on um, at least one, maybe two days, I don't even know yet, of uh, op-eds on environmental racism, which is an issue in the Latino community that's been happening for years, but it just isn't as talked about as it should be, right? So instead of a reporter reporting on the issue, we're letting the community member, some of them, I looked for those voices and some of them just came in on their own. So that's how it works. Sometimes people just send something in and then I bring it to their attention. I say, hey, I received this op-ed from Maria or somebody else. And then they go, oh, well, maybe that should be one where we're looking for more voices, right? Um, and sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Sometimes it's just a standalone where you just know you want to run that one piece. We don't necessarily look for other people to weigh in on that same topic, but they're great topics. I mean, people, people in San Diego never run out of things that they want to talk about, at least since I've been, been there in the very short time that I've been there. Well, we have the unique situation that we're in a region, which includes two countries, two big border cities, sure. and there's so much going on. One of the uh, issues that came up, and it's funny because I'll copy Jeff on a lot of the emails I send in, and it's very sensitive because I'm, I'm involved in a couple of other uh, committees that you might not know. I was recently appointed to the Human Relations Committee uh, by the supervisors here in San Diego, so I'm active with that. And then there's another coalition that I invited Jeff actually to join, and he did join, and it's the uh, San Diego, they call it the Hate Coalition, but we're gonna change the name to the Anti-Hate Coalition. Mm -hmm. So we do we have law enforcement and we have organizations involved and we're meeting with various media outlets and we'll be contacting you guys uh, soon. And we're meeting and talking to them about various issues. And one of them that was brought to my attention because I mentioned the fact that the other day I saw, you know, Chris Reed and also Bryce Miller at the UT, they both wrote columns and I immediately contacted them and I said, Hey, wait a minute. Uh, how come when you wrote that incident, you're talking about African Americans, you said, you were talking about the George Floyd incident and they said, an unarmed black man. And I go, this issue is not about unarmed black men. This issue is about black men. Why did you have to put unarmed? And you know, they got defensive. The same thing happened with Neil Morgan long ago. And he had said an ethical Mexican businessman. I go, Neil, 
because Neil's very friendly with Mexico, you know, rest in peace, Neil. Mm -hmm. And he, the next day he, he, he said, I apologize. I go, you should have just put Mexican businessman. So I was having this conversation with this anti-hate coalition because we're visiting radio stations. And one of my friends from the Arab community, community said, and I had never thought about it because I always think about it like when the unarmed black man or, or ethical business. He said, the good Samaritan. And I go, till this point, I had never thought of that. Because the Bible story, why don't you just say Samaritan? <laughs> they say, good, we all, we're all used to hearing the good Samaritan. And I go, you know, that's true. That's how somebody well, pointed it out. I think it's important that you do point those things out, that everybody yeah. points things out. And you know what? Not, not only the negative, but the positive. I used to tell people that when I worked at Channel 10, I remember that. Because most of the time you hear from the community when it's something that they don't like. Amen. But I used to tell people, if you like something that you see, like, wow, you guys actually did a, gr a good story in our community. Let them know. Let the managers yes. know. You know what? We want to see more of that. Yes. Because yes. if they don't get that feedback, then, you know, you, you, there's, there's walls, not bridges. They shut you out. They just shut you out. They go, oh, yeah. you're so yeah. and so complaining again. And no, so I make like, a point. I make a it's point. Great that you did. Yeah. It's great. It's great. Did. Yeah, I make absolutely. a point, and, and I monitor the television stations, and I'll contact like the news director at NBC or CBS or ABC, and I'll say, "Hey, that was really a good story. I'm glad you mentioned that." Or and I'll say, "Hey, this reporter said that." that. I yeah, wish more people did that because they don't realize also that they are in control, um, especially with the TV stations of ratings and advertising. You know, Latinos are a big block. The black community isn't as large of a block here in San Diego just because of the numbers, but there's a voice, you know, and now people are starting to understand that a little more, right? There's a voice. Absolutely. And regardless of how small your community is, uh, it's equally important. You know, even though it's only like the, the issue with the, uh, the naming of the Washington football team or the, or the Cleveland baseball team, I've always been opposed to those names. And then sometimes they'll say, oh, but it's such a small community. And I go, so? I don't care if it's two people. If they're telling you it's offensive, we got to listen. You know, so I, I, I imagine that that's going to change. They're no longer going to call the Washington the Redskins or the, the Cleveland Indians right. with mascot. Well, here that's we have important. That's important. We have such a large, we have so many reservations. We have so many Native American, um, you know, culture, beautiful culture, and, and we don't cover them. Maybe they don't want us there as a mainstream media, you know? But you gotta build that bridge. It's not all about casinos. There's way more to those people and their beautiful culture and language and history. And, and we don't hear about it because the, the bridge is not there. And that's something we're working on too. And you mentioned earlier something that I wanted to touch on, um, the use of undocumented and unauthorized. Um, so recently we did a series of op-eds um, on DACA when the Supreme Court made its ruling and three of the writers that wrote for that wrote opinion pieces for us um, used described the the term undocumented to describe themselves so when when it got to the editors they changed the word undocumented to unauthorized because they said that was a Union Tribune policy. And I didn't even know that. I didn't, you know, I didn't get the policy book. I'm telling you, I started on March 16th and two days later, they gave me a laptop and told me I couldn't come back to the office anymore. So there's a lot of the training part that I didn't get, you know, the manual or whatever. Um, and it is AP style, Associated Press. There was a big book. I even have it right here. It's style book. Huge, right? Style book. So this is what they go by. It's kind of the Bible of journalism. And um, that's really what they go by. And then there's some policies that they set forth in every newsroom in America about how they're going to call things or label things, right? And so the UT's policy was to use the phrase unauthorized. And that was a policy that was set 12 years ago, is what I'm learning now. But three of the writers really complained about that. They were like, wait a minute. Not only, you know, did you change it, with, you know, I don't call myself unauthorized, so how can you call, you know, they were really upset about it. So instead of the leadership there saying, you know what, sorry, it is what it is, they invited them to a community advisory board this week, we had one, 
and it was all done on Zoom, but the two writers were a part of that conversation. In fact, they dominated a lot of the speaking in the, in the meeting to express their feelings about why they thought that term was outdated. So right now, as you and I are speaking, um, they're, they're in serious talks about revisiting that whole issue and, and coming up with, some, with another term that's more acceptable. And I think that's appropriate. I, I, I do too, but we never had, I never complained about them using uh, undocumented. I complained about them using illegal. You, you mean Ali yeah. and Irving, you know, the people that came out? They, yeah. they, they said undocumented or do they said illegal? No, no, they said undocumented. Yeah, because the, I, don't, I don't know why they would change that word because that's not an their issue. Term, their appropriate term that they're using right now is unauthorized. Ah. But the writers the was, did it the like that. Was, the, that would be for the instead of the term illegal, not undocumented. Because I never liked when 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 um, when the Union Tribune accepted to not use it illegal, uh -huh. and they came up with unauthorized. I thought really unauthorized, but that's what they came up with. But that was only for the illegal. So yeah, it's a changing process. It's a yeah, changing and process. It, times change, things change, and technically, as I pointed out in the meeting, if somebody's here under the DACA program. They're, they are authorized to be here. They're authorized, yeah. They're not unauthorized. So, you know, I think over the years, uh, terms get stale. Um, I will go on the record right now with you for the first time ever and say I'm not a fan of Latinx. I don't like that. I don't like somebody to call me Latinx because I don't call myself Latinx. That's not what I refer to myself. But, um, you know, the, we, we just keep having these new labels. You know, we're Hispanics, we're Latinos, and you know, now we're Latinx, are we Chicanos? You know, it, it's like, where does it end? There's just so <laughs> many labels, where does it end? That's one of my I want to be a human people. being, I want to be a woman, I want to be a human <laughs> being. <laughs> you gotta be careful because I, I agree with you. But uh, like people will, will sometimes tell me, well, what are you, Chicano, Latino, Hispanic? And I go, not Hispanic. I go, number one, I'm very proudly Mexican, y punto. Soy mexicano y punto. No soy mexicano americano, da, 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 da. And, and so like one of, the, one of my many debates with Bill O'Reilly, he got really mad. And he goes, no, you got to call yourself Mexican-American. And I go, hey, Bill, I call myself what I want to call myself. If you want to call yourself Irish-American or Irish or American, that's up to you. But when you you're ask me what I am, Mexican, I'm you? Mexican. You're dual. I'm born San Diego, but I'm but Mexican. You're dual. I'm you're dual citizen. Dual, I have dual nationality, but when they ask me what I am, I, I say I'm Mexican. I'm Mexicano. It wasn't my fault that I was born here. I'm not against the United States, but I'm just proud of my roots, right? And, so, and you know, just it's it's also what you have in your heart. I really yeah. do believe that. You know, um, I'm not Boricua by blood, but I grew up with Boricuas, and you know, it's in my heart. It's in my soul. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, my black brothers and sisters too. A lot of my teachers were black and Jewish growing up, and I learned a lot from them. So I, I'm black in my heart, I'm a little Jewish in my heart. You know, I have, it's, it's what's inside of you, you know? Um, right. And just the labels, they just keep changing. They just keep changing so much. And, uh, you know, I'm, yo, yo soy casada con un mexicano de Mexico. And so we have these conversations at home too sometimes, you know? Um, you know, when I've gone to Mexico to cover a lot of stories, I've been deeper in deeper parts of Mexico, Mexico City and beyond. And a lot of my Mexican brothers and sisters will let me know that I'm not Mexicana. You know, oh, no, 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 eres gringa, eres, <laughs> eres that, yeah. So there, are, you know, to different people, there's different, there's different sentiment, right? That's right. Well, Laura, it's been a, a, it's great to connect with you once again. You've done some great things and you're continuing to do great things. Um, what advice would you give somebody that inter is interested in getting involved in media? You know, they, 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 they see the things that you've done and all this type of stuff and, hey, I'm thinking about getting involved in media, whatever that role would be. What kind of advice would you give them? Well, you know what? I will always be a fan of journalism. Um, there's a lot of people that knock it. Uh, it, the industry has changed tremendously. So I will say to anybody that wants to do it, be ready and willing to move because you, you're you not, it's very rare that you're going to end up doing journalism in your hometown where, with all your family and friends surrounding you. It's not impossible, but it's just unlikely. Um, but most, you know, the principles remain like 
learn your skills, use your language skills for those of you that have them. But the principles remain, like know your facts. Don't put out false information. You know, don't allow somebody to tag you as a fake news person. You know, have your facts and your ducks in a row and find great stories. There's so many wonderful stories to tell out there. So, you know, let, it, let us multiply, let us multiply and, and just try to uh, be great storytellers and, and speak your truth and look for both sides of the story and learn how to shoot and edit. Those are so, so important nowadays. You can't just be a TV journalist or a radio journalist or a print journalist. You have to know how to do everything if you wanna be a, you know, be a good journalist and get a job in this industry. But it's not impossible and I'm always, always willing to give advice and mentor young people, always. And how about the part, because I've had people ask me uh, you know, that question about being a journalist. How about the part, a lot of times the person that wants to be a journalist wants to be uh, in front of the camera. They want to be a reporter. And I tell them, well, that's nice. And hopefully you'll be able to do that. But you might have to start elsewhere, you know, like in the cutting room or assistant producer. How about that part? Because I think a lot of times people, like my nephew, for example, he would always say he wants to be in the movies. And I go, that's fantastic. I go, but you might have to start here. Not everybody gets to be in front of the camera just like that. And actually, yeah. he did work with Lourdes Sandoval at Univision. <laughs> but but, 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 uh, but what, what advice about you want to be a journalist, but you got to kind of pay the price. You know, you might have to be working on this part or that part. In, in when, the I was, when I was in Chicago in my 20s, a uh, white male news director pulled me aside when, I, when he found out that I wanted to be a reporter. And his name was Tom Dolan. And he pulled me aside and he said, why do you want to be a reporter? He said, go into management. There's no Latinas. There's not enough Latinas in management. Go that route, you know, be a manager. And I was like, I don't want to be a manager. I want to be a reporter. You know, I was like, you know, just what you're saying right now. I want to be in front of the camera. I want to be a reporter. I want my name up there. And I went ahead and I went my route. But now, almost 30 years later, he had such a point. Do I regret that I didn't follow his advice? There's a little part of me that does because, you know, you hit the nail on the head when you say you can have all the people in front of the camera or the bylines that are Latino, Black, Asian, you know, Arab American, LGBT, whatever. But if you don't have people in those power making decisions, uh, you know, people in power making roles where they're making the decisions about what's covered, you're not going to see the change that really is needed out there. So I would say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like to, you know, burst anyone's bubble or take away their dreams because I didn't want somebody to do that to me. But I would say just try the different roles out. And what nobody told me when I was young is that producers become managers. TV producers can become managers. Nobody told me that. If somebody would have told me that, I probably would have at least tried it and then see what I liked better. So that would be my, my advice that I would leave with anyone. Try those different roles out and see what grabs you. And uh, this is the most important year of our lives, in my opinion, because of the election. So it's important that people pay attention to what's being said in the newsrooms, what you're reading, find out the truth. More important than ever. It's more important than ever. So we really appreciate the work that you do, Laura. And one of the questions I ask everybody, and it'll be my uh, final question, uh, to you, to Laura Castaneda, what is love? Mm, what is love? Familia. It's familia first. And um, I'm so blessed. I had a, a biological child late in life. <laughs> I was 43 when I had my son. He's 13. Uh, the light of my life. And uh, I ended up raising three beautiful, beautiful children from my husband's first marriage. Um, and it's a story for another time, but they're beautiful children and they, I am blessed because be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I wanted one child and I ended up with four, but you know what? They have fulfilled my life. You think when you have a career, uh, especially in media, I think that it's just everything. Your career is just everything. And it's very important to me. My career is very important to me, but you don't really know what the full circle is until you have the love of your family, your own family and a child, you know? Really, it, it completes everything that I am. So yeah, Familia first. Familia first, I couldn't agree with you more. 
Uh, Laura Castaneda, muchísimas gracias. Thank you for your lifetime dedication to working okay. with all of us, including all of us. And we're so glad that you came from Chicago to San Diego and that you play such an important role today as you have another position with the San Diego Union Tribune. Thank you. I'll do my best for the community. I always will. Yeah. And it's so nice that I got to see Sarah, kind of, for two minutes, but I can see her name there on the screen. <laughs> I'm always proud. Of, I'm always so proud of my students when I see what they're doing. It just it fulfills me. It really does. I'm so happy. Well, she's the star of, uh, of Magnificent Mujer. She's the one that makes sure that, that we get this uh, podcast out there, Buen Hombre Magnificent Mujer. So on behalf of Sarah Bella and myself, Enrique Morones, muchísimas gracias. You can catch this podcast on all the regular podcasts, including buenhombre.org or magnificentmujer.org. Our guest today, Laura Castañeda, muchísimas gracias. Amor, si se puede. Gracias. Gracias a ustedes.